We've been doing this for 21 years. Um, I told you guys I'd come straight ahead, so you know, with coming straight ahead, I was gonna take some contact. I could have sat back and just boxed and, and counterpunched and made it boring. I didn't want to do that. I feel like I owe the fans a last hurrah. So um, I went out there and that was the game plan. Me and my dad communicated before we went out there. The whole game plan was to go out there and let him shoot heavy shots from the beginning. Um, uh, take him down the stretch and do what we do best. And that's what we did tonight. Um, uh, we had a, we had a, we had a, pretty, we had a, a cool training camp. You know, I didn't box for, for, the, uh, for the last month. I didn't do no sparring. But, you know, there's no excuses. Um, he came out here, he fought a hell of a fight, a uh, hell of a stand-up guy, and I went out there and just did what I do best. Uh, uh, found a way to trap him and uh, broke him down. And, um, you know, I want to say congratulations to my team. Um, strong team, I got, I got a real strong team. I've been working with my team for a lot of years. You know, I've been knowing Dana White for 21 years since I came to Las Vegas. And I'm one of the first guys that believed in Dana White before anybody believed in Dana White. I was the first guy, that, one of the first guys to give Dana White a chance, but nobody wanted to give him a chance. Dana, thank you. And um, uh, Leonard Ellaby, uh, you know, CEO of, of CEO of Mayweather Promotions. We don't always see eye to eye, but at the end of the day, we always get we always get great results when we get the job done. Uh, me and my father, we don't we, we don't always see eye to eye, but we, but we always get great results, and that's really what it's about. You know, my publicist Kelly Swanson, um, CBS, Showtime, Stephen Espinosa. I mean, there's so many people I want to thank. You know, the CEO of, of the UFC. Um, you know, the fans from Ireland that came over, and you know, all the media, the MMA media, the boxing media, for covering this event. You know, I want to go out with a bang. I told you guys, it'd be blood, sweat, and tears. And um, I told you, he was, a hell of, uh, he was a hell of a fighter standing up. Kind of shocked me. And um, I told my dad, it was something I was talking to my dad about, that we keep, that we, that me and him would keep amongst us, because certain things don't go out to the public, you know. Um, but we had a game plan. Our game plan was to take our time, let him shoot all his heavy shots, keep walking him down, keep walking him down, shoot heavy shots to the body, shoot big shots up, up, upstairs. And, he, and my dad said around, my dad thought it was gonna be a little bit early around the, the seventh or the sixth. But you know, it, it took us a little longer than we expected, but we did, what we, we did what we said we was gonna do. And I promise everybody, remember this. You know, I told you people, I guarantee you, this fight wouldn't go the distance. I told you, I was going for the knockout, I was going straight ahead. And with going straight ahead, you're gonna take contact, I understand that. But, you know, after 21 years uh, in the sport of boxing, you know, um, I had some great fights, I had some boring fights. But at the end of the day, uh, I will be always remembered as a winner, you know, no matter how you win, as long as you win. And I knew how to, I, you know, I know how to dissect my opponent, I know, I know how to go out there and break them down and just stick to the game plan. Floyd, uh, right straight in, straight in front of you. What up, Kevin? Uh, congrats on the win. First, I, I have a couple questions. First, you mentioned you hadn't sparred uh, the last month. Was it an injury or why not? Um, it was an injury, of course. Not an injury like that. But I wanted my hands to be 100% for the fight. You know, I didn't want my, you know, my hands to grow brittle. You know, everybody knows that. I wanted to have, I wanted my hands to be solid when I cut my hair. So when I'm shooting hard shots, you know, I'm able to break the guy down. Whereas I, I fought a box and I got a, a serious hand injury, I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't be able to punch as hard. My, my second question though is, you leave, you were the biggest star, you sold the most pay-per-views, the most tickets. Where does boxing go from here after this? How do you generate the next level of stars? And, and who do you see as the guys that are gonna be the ones selling the million pay-per-views and keep up the momentum that you have in 2017 in boxing? Okay, I'm gonna touch on this. I wanna, I wanna touch on that, Kevin, but I wanna say something. We did break the record tonight for the, you know, the biggest gate. Me and Pacquiao have done 72 million. I think we've done somewhere over 80 million, you know, for the live gate. We also, on paper, on pay-per-view, it took us so long to come uh, come out for the fight. I know, I know all the fans was anticipating, like, why you guys taking so long? The reason why we took so long is because the servers, uh, the pay-per-view server in California and in Florida crashed. 
So we want to make sure we get everything uh, back in place, and you know, everything in the right place so that everybody can see pay-per-view and give everybody a show. And you ask me about who do I think is the next superstar in boxing. There's a lot of hell of a fighters out there. There's a lot of young lions out there, you know. Uh, you won't see me in the ring no more, so any guy that's calling me out, forget it. I'm okay. You know, I had a great career. I had a tremendous career. Um, I'm proud of Badu Jack. I'm proud of Javante Tank Davis. I'm proud of everybody that's under the Mayweather Promotions banner, you know. And of course, you know, I have to say I'm proud of Al Heyman, you know, just uh, being an advisor slash manager, us being business partners, us communicating, us knowing one another for over a decade, and us, you know, uh, taking boxing to that next level. You know, and Steven, and I can't thank Steven enough, and I can't thank Showtime enough, or CBS, just for believing in me. You know, I had a, you know, and I went to, show, I went to Showtime, I told Showtime, these are the things that I want to do. You know, I want to roll the dice and take chances and do record-breaking things. And tonight, we broke the Pacquiao pay-per-view number. We, we broke, the, all I'm doing is breaking my own record. So, but hopefully, I can find the next Floyd Mayweather that can sell a million homes, Kevin. You know, everything takes time, but eventually, we'll find the next superstar. Hey, Floyd. Straight back. Congratulations. Right here, baby. Oh, hey. It's Dan Rayfield here. I know, Dan. All right. You're right for ESPN, Dan. I've been knowing you better. Congratulations on the victory tonight. I wanted to ask you uh, one thing about yourself and what about Connor. First of all, now that your career is over, you say you're going back into retirement. Other than your, your business interests with Mayweather Promotions and your gentleman's club here in Las Vegas, what other things do you want to do with the rest of your life? I just want to help these fighters. You know, I look forward to becoming a, a boxing trainer. Um, just helping trainers. As far as looking from, my dad is a hell of a trainer. You know, um, he taught me the sport. And everything that he taught me from day one, I still know. But I want to help just other trainers help make fighters better. You know, I want to go out there and help fighters better and teach fighters about becoming a, a superstar, not just in the ring, but on the outside. A lot of times fighters think that, oh, I'm undefeated or I'm a knockout puncher. That makes me a superstar. It takes more than that. It, I mean, it takes a, a lot of work on the outside and surround yourself with the right team to become a mega superstar. Floyd, my other question for you is, if, I'd like you to just take a minute and assess Conor McGregor that you saw in the ring tonight. I'd like you to maybe mention about what you felt as far as his power, uh, his skills, and frankly, how you think he might do if he was fighting a, a regular fighter, not a Floyd Mayweather. Um, he was, he was solid. You know, I've been on for a couple of years, and I'm a lot older now. Remember, I told you guys, I'm not the same Floyd Mayweather I was 21 years ago. I told you guys, I'm not the same Floyd Mayweather I was two years ago. But remember, I still have a hell of an IQ. And, you know, I'm still a thinker. So what I did was, I mean, as far as the question about it, he's solid. I mean, I feel it before, so that's why I kept coming straight ahead. It obviously wasn't the type of power to say, I can't come forward, because if it was that type of power, I wouldn't have came forward. Floyd, just to follow up on Connor, there was a lot of concern coming into this fight that the rules were going to be followed, and it was a little bit rough at times in there. There were some, there were some warnings. How did you feel about the way Connor conducted himself in the ring tonight? Um, I let the referee do his job. You know, I let the referee do his job. I let the referee do his job. I'm not here to bash the referee. I mean, but you guys know what's going on. Um, a lot of rabbit punching. A lot. You know, things happen, but, you know, you live and you learn. Um, you know, the referee is a hell of a referee. Conor McGregor is a hell of a fighter. I'm not here to bash anyone. I just went out there to do my job tonight. I did want to ask, at the end of the fifth round, you did have a little push after the bell. What kind of wonder what was going through your head at that point? Was that frustration? Was that the same message? What was that about? You know, give fans what they want to see. I pushed them and told them, you still ain't knocking me out yet. I thought you said it wasn't going past four. Show me your real power. That's all. It was, it, you know, it just, you know, trash talking that, you know, fighters do it, whether it's MMA or boxing. You know, we talk trash. That's what we do. You know, when the best compete against the best, we want to be pushed. And that's, you know, that's how uh, boxing and MMA goes. Lloyd, uh, of your 50 victories, what in, what in your mind was your most impressive? Well, every fight played a major key, you know. Uh, not just number 50, 
just to get to this point, you know, a lot of people ask me about Rocky Marciano. Rocky Marciano is a, is a, is a legend. He paved the way for me to be one man. There's a lot of champions that paved the way, paved the way for me to be one man. I'm very appreciative, very thankful. And um, like I said, every fight comes to me. Not just one fight, uh, not number 48, not number 49, not number 50. Every fight played a major key in, in my career. Uh, since Toronto, uh, tonight is surprising the build up in like the media tour. Can I ask the same question tonight? Tonight, did McGregor surprise you in the ring tonight? I said again. Tonight is surprise. Did, did McGregor surprise you anyway tonight? I knew he was going to be awkward from the beginning, but right before we came out, you know, I talked with the I talked with the legendary trainer, uh, Floyd Mayweather, my father. We talked, and he said, you know, we communicate. You know, when I was younger, you know, when I got older, me and my dad is able to talk. There's a difference between when I'm 21 and I'm 40. Me and my dad is able to have a, a father-son conversation. We communicated, we talked, and my dad was in the corner a couple of times, and he wanted more out of me, but he knew the reason why, he knew what I was doing. We talked about it in the back, and said, the game plan is, let him shoot his low, let him shoot all the hard shots, he's gonna try to kill me. So I'm trying to you know, keep switching, keep switching. We'll take our time, shoot hard shots to the body, eventually break them down. We get them around the sixth and the seventh, but he lasts a little, little, little longer than we expected, but you know, I stuck to the game. Uh, Floyd? Over here to your left. Hi Floyd, it's Rebecca with Hollywood Unlocked. So I was wondering, the internet has been going in on Connor for hitting him in the back of the head a few times. He had a few warnings. Did that throw you off at all? Um, I'm not here to bash him. You know, I told you guys what I was going to do. Um, I knew he was going to be a tough competitor. It's about pushing, you know, pushing himself. And in number 49, it wasn't good enough. Number 48 wasn't good enough. So I told you guys I was going to come straight ahead for number 50 can be good. I can't be the, I can't be the fighter and the rabbit. I have to choose what I'm going to be. And um, a lot of rabbit punches, a lot of hitting in the back of the head, hitting in the back. Once again, I'm not the referee, I'm just the fighter. That's for the referee to do his job. And I told the referee in the back, if you go back and, and view it, when the referee was in the back with me, I told him, he's going to be doing a lot of rabbit punches. And my only concern was hit me in the back of the head. And I said, I want him to keep the punches on the side and in the front. But all the shots was coming to the back. But he's tough. He's tough guy. Floyd, did you feel any effects of age tonight? Oh, no, not at all. It, it, I mean, it is what it is, you know. Uh, I just know that going straight ahead, if you're going straight ahead, you know, with your, with your guards up, you're going to get some contact. You know, I'm trying to close the gap. He was throwing some awkward shots from an awkward position. You know, landed a couple of uppercuts, hooks. You know, but I'm, I'm more like, you know, stay calm, relax. You've been here before because, you know, uh, you can't play into the crowd. You can't play You can't play into his stance. Just take your time, stick to the game plan, and you'll get the job done. I thought a great example of, you know, your legacy and how long you've lasted was Gervonta's situation, missing weight. As you reflect on all the difficulties that you have to endure to reach 50 and now, is that the ultimate sense of pride that you take away from your career? Like what? What take away from my career? Like just, what? just you know, enduring all those things, that, uh, trying to make way, taking on each opponent, like you said, dissecting each, each opponent, figuring each guy out, and doing what you do um, over time. I mean, just throughout my career, when I think about my career, I never wanted, you know, as far as, you know, making weight, when you ask me about Cervante, tech, making weight. <clears throat> He's young. But when I was young, I think I would have made those same mistakes if I didn't have my father in my life. You know, just being a coach that was extremely hard on me. You know, I think that if he didn't discipline me in boxing, I don't really know where, you know, how my career would have played out. You know, I didn't want to slack, and I didn't want to seem irresponsible or not disciplined. So that's why I always sacrifice, you got to sacrifice something to get something. So that's why I've always made sacrifices uh, to get to a certain level. And to get to the pinnacle, you got to make sacrifices, and that's what I did. 
deploy. I know you said everything went according to plan tonight, but is, was there any point that when Connor pushed you to something you didn't want him to do this night? I mean, you follow of, of what you comment on what he said that he made you fall like a Mexican tonight. Say it again. He wanted to what? Uh, he said uh, over the ring, uh, uh, he made you fall like a Mexican tonight. Did you, did you, did you buy that? Did you, did you, did you agree with that? Listen, I could, everybody know in this room <clears throat> that's watched me fight. I could have easily outboxed Conor McGregor, Conor Hudson, all night. That's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to go out with a bang. I told you guys I would come straight ahead. I feel like I owe that to the fans for the Pacquiao fight. Even though I don't owe anybody nothing, I put the pressure on myself and did it myself. And that was the goal of mine. And I told you guys that this fight wouldn't go the distance. Go back and look at all the interviews that I did. Hello. Hey. Chris Rudrow from the Sportsman. First off, congratulations, not just on tonight, but on 50 fights that have gone your way. Congratulations, well played, sir. The people that we've spoken to ahead of this fight, though, we've asked them, what chance does Conor McGregor have? How does he beat Floyd Mayweather? And these are other fighters and just fight fans in general. They said one thing Floyd Mayweather's got to overcome tonight is the will of the Irish. Did you feel the Irish presence in the crowd tonight? I never focus on, <clears throat> I never focus on anything but the guy that's in front of me. Because when it comes down to it, I always said this for many, many years, that fans cannot fight for you. And one thing I know I can do, I can fight. So, uh, the fans, when they shout and scream, I don't worry about nothing. I just, you know, keep my composure and stick to the game plan. Constantly keep coming ahead, coming ahead, pushing me, pushing me, pushing me back, pushing me back. You know, um, when he first come out for the first 20 seconds of the, of the round, when he, go, when he go down, when he go back to his corner and he sit down, I said when he come out, he's gonna come out for 30 seconds and fight hard. And then he gonna break. And once he breaks, that's when I'm gonna shoot a hard shot to the body, hit him with a hard shot on top, and keep pushing him back. Keep pushing him back. Remember, I told you guys, Wake, Wake doesn't win fights. Fighting wins fights. And then, you know, when I said talking doesn't win fights, Fighting wins fights, meaning that when we was on the, you know, when we was on stage for the weigh-in, I don't have to do no more talking. We fighting tomorrow, so I did, I did enough talking on our tour, basically. So you know, everybody said, "Oh, maybe you was talking on the tour." Okay, I did, I did, I did a lot of talking on the tour, but now it's time to fight. We're 24 hours, we're 24 hours away from, from one, the biggest fight in the world, the biggest combat fight in the world. There's no need to talk anymore. There's no need to talk anymore. And remember, all the fans that was here, those are soccer fans. And for, for the international people, those are football fans. <laughs> you know, but he's a, hell of a, he's a hell of a fighter. And then, you know, I, I hear him talking about, oh, you should let me go out on my back and go out on my face. No, the referee saves you because the referee is thinking about your future. Because you're still, you're still young, you're still young, and we want you to be able to fight fight again someday, so the referee is saving you, he's not saving me. That's all I'm saying. Hey Floyd, um, you, I'd say, I'll say you sound pretty certain on the retirement this time around, but obviously we've uh, heard that before, so I just wonder what, what is different this time around, and uh, is, is it a different feeling than previous retirement? Yes, I did walk away from the sport before. Very comfortable. I didn't have to come back. Um, but you know, um, you know, like I said, we do foolish things sometimes. All of us do foolish things. But I'm not a damn fool. If I see an opportunity to make 300, 350 million in, th in 36 minutes, why not? I had to do it. But this is the last one. You guys have my word. Um, I had a great career, you know, a great career. Um, I can't complain about anything, you know. <clears throat> I can't complain about anything, you know. Steven Espinosa, like I said before, and CBS, they gave me the biggest deal in the sports history. Right here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Karen Bryant for MMA Heat. Floyd, you know, you talked about not sparring, um, and I am curious right here. Hey, how are you? 
you talked about not to. You know, I got a sharp mind. I see you when I walked in over to the left. Yeah, you did. You looked right at my camera. Thank you so much for that. Okay. <laughs> it's online already. So, um, so you said you didn't spar much for the last month, and then you make the request to have the glove out size dropped. So, how did that feel to you tonight? You know, did your punches feel different? Did they feel more powerful? How did that affect your performance? Do you think? Remember, I told you guys this in the last. You go back and look at the last press conference. This is exactly what I said. Remember, you can give it, but I've been hit by some of the best punchers in the world throughout my career. Most of the, ninety percent of the time, I'm dishing it out. I told Conor McGregor, this is exactly what I told him. I said, you can you can dish it out, but you have to be able to take it. The same way you dish it out, you have to be able to take it. Just just like when you have. Uh, children, you got children, and they joking with each other. One want to joke with the other, but the other don't want, but when one feeling good and the other not feeling good, they not even move the joke. So, just like in boxing, most times your big punchers, they can't take it. They can take it early on, but down the stretch, they can't take it. So my other question to you is, obviously you guys went back and forth a lot during the press conferences leading up, but Connor is always somebody who's noble in defeat. So what was he saying to you inside the ring afterwards? What, what, what did he say when you guys exchanged words after the fight? I just told him, so I told him, you know, you're a tough competitor, uh, good fight, you know, keep up, you know, keep up the good work, basically. You know, I always want to carry myself like a gentleman, even though, you know, uh, you gotta realize when we in the press conference, we, when we doing what we doing, that's my job. You know, he's the notorious one. I'm the money man, so we gotta get a, get a fan what they want to see. When the fan, when the fan, you know, when we done the press tour, we went to four four cities and three countries in four or four or five days. So when we had arenas like this, packed with twenty thousand fans, we gotta give a show. And a lot of people thought it was fake. No, we. We didn't like each other, we probably still don't like each other, but we still have we still have to have to act like gentlemen at the end of the day, you know. I can't come here, you know, after making, you know, over 300 million, I'm not gonna be like, oh, I don't like you, good fight, you know, make your career go on. Floyd, right here in front. Floyd, have you had a chance to talk to your kids yet? And what does it mean to you and your family to have you finally officially retired? And what does that mean to them? Um. I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure they're happy. You know, I, I'm pretty sure they're happy because they get to see me a lot more. You know, we get to spend a lot, spend a lot more time together, and that's really what it's about. You know, it's, it's about family. You know, um, I came out here first. You know, to Vegas. Well, my uncle Roger came out here to Vegas first, and then I didn't even have no plans on moving. Actually, I didn't even have no plans on moving to Las Vegas. I came out here. You know, Turn professional at 19. Uh, and I can remember when I turned professional, but I always talk about the story in the dressing room, you know, at, at the Mayweather Boxing Club. I go into that, you know, when I went to Top Rank, the motion company, I went to, when I went when I went inside the office, I looked. They said they was talking, and they moved a piece of paper out of the way. Then I seen that check. To myself, I was like, I am like, damn. I ain't never seen that many O's in my life. <clears throat> I'm from, you know, I'm from, I come from poverty. I come from the inner city. The check was only $100,000. But to me, when I seen the check, it looked like $100 million because I'm from the inner city. I never seen those type of numbers, you know. Hood rich, hood rich to me is, you know, thirty dollars or forty, sixty dollars $60,000. That's hood rich, you hear about it. But when you're actually seeing $100,000, Everything top rank was saying to me, I didn't hear anything. I just wanted to sign on a dotted line and get the check. And I feel like I'm the richest man in the world at 19, <clears throat> receiving $100,000. But, you know, I, I, went to the, I went to the gym, I never slacked. I continue to work hard every day. I never put nothing before I put in my box, and nothing. I worked hard, extremely hard every day. Um, my dad still was in prison because, you know, my dad left my life when I was 16, when my dad came back to my life, when, when my dad came back in my life, I was 21. So a lot of people want to kind of, kind of know about our relationship. So it was kind of rocky, you know. When my dad, when my dad left me, I was, I was basically 
a teenage kid. When he come back into my life, I'm an adult because I'm paying my own bills. I'm responsible. I got my own house. I got my own car. I got my own everything. So it's kind of hard for us to really get on the same page. <clears throat> he still is the best trainer to ever train, hands down. I mean, because I beat all these fighters with everything that my dad taught me. There's key things to there's key things in boxing that I'm just in fighting period that fighters need, and that's why I had to up some most fighters is because I've done those key things that my dad taught me. Boy, back here. Floyd? Uh, right here. Congratulations. Um, you're famous all in the world for your defensive skills, but I was wondering how exciting it was in that 10th round when you were landing one shot after the other just before the, the refs uh, stopped the, the fight, and you know, to let it go, the, all those, you know, those last shots in your career. I mean, counter, counter, of course. I mean, it's like it's like a catch 22. If he didn't get knocked out, I mean, if he didn't get if, if he hit the canvas, then he they would have said, "Why are you guys didn't stop it early?" Then when you stop, they're gonna say, "Oh, I didn't hit the canvas." I mean, you didn't throw a punch for a whole one minute and was getting hit with big shots. But like I said, I'm not here to bash Conor McGregor. I'm not here to do that. We talk. We done enough talking. I told him before. We both done a, a lot of talking. You know, a lot of barking, it's time to fight. That was it. Okay, two more. The back, Andrew. What we at? Right on, going up to the top. Here in the back, uh, Salvador Rodriguez from ESPN Deportes, Floyd. Here, you back. Oh, I know you, what's up? Yeah, thank you. Floyd, what do you think that this is your legacy in sport? What is the, the things that you change in this sport that you show to the, to the young guys? What is your legacy around the, your career? Uh, run it by me again? Yeah, what do you think that this is your legacy in boxing? Uh, what do you show I mean, to, the, to the new guys? What do you change in this sport? Um, I think, you know, every day, I think, even communicating with Steven Espinosa, Showtime. Every day we're trying to find that next Floyd Mayweather. It's not easy. It's not easy. And I'm pretty sure Steven was extremely happy when I said, uh, we're going to do this fight. You know, I'm the first one that talked to the CEO of the UFC. Um, one day I was on the phone with the CEO of the UFC. And I said, yo, uh, me and Connor can fight. And he was like, no, Floyd, not that fight. I don't think he's going to, he want to fight, but eventually we made it happen. But as far as my legacy, um, you know, the most important thing to me about my career is the things that I did on the outside. You know, making the money on the inside, but making my money work for me on the outside. That's the most important thing to me about my career. Thank you. Thank you. No, you know, yeah, we're going to be... We're gonna let a few more go because that guy came to Girl Collection and gave me an interview. He went to MMA when he pulled. He did support my strip club. Right here. 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 Right I was at the gym a couple of days ago. You see Adrian Broner, you see Earl Spence. Uh, a lot of these young African-American fighters look up to you, not what you did inside the ring, but what you did outside of the ring. What is the, what are a couple of things that you try to teach these young African-American fighters who a lot of times feel like they're villainized uh, because they're black, uh, to, to make it not just inside the ring, but outside of the ring? Well, I, when, when these young fighters get their chance, you know, when they get their chance, we can't think about just right now. You know, a lot of fighters, I was, I was like that, when I, but I got the money real young. The 100,000, that that's the number of the first check I got, but all throughout that week, I got some more checks from top rank. So, you know, I think by the time I, by the time I was 20, probably by the time I was 20, 21, I was a millionaire. But these, these, these young fighters want to buy, roll, they, they see Floyd Mayweather, with all the watches, all the diamond chains, all the cars. They have to invest their money. 
That's very, very, very important. They have to invest their money. And that's what I try to teach them. Teach them. You know, Floyd Mayweather was able to buy a diamond chain, a car, a house, everyone from smart investments. You know, you have to, you know, when, you, when I get with my billionaire buddies, when I get with my billionaire buddies, I don't get with my billionaire buddies and say, oh, I'm happy to hang in your house. Oh, I'm happy to ride in your jet. You know, I don't, I don't say, oh, I'm happy to ride in your yacht. I say, teach me what you, teach me how you did it so I can have the same thing. So my grandchildren, my great grandchildren can have it. Because I try to teach these fighters that becoming rich, you, 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 can be, you, you become rich. Wealth is something that is established to where wealth, when you're getting millions every month, you know, like myself, making million dollars, making millions, millions every month. But you know, you know, I have to take my hat off to Al Hamer also because he's, he's, a, he's a very, very shrewd businessman. He's fucking unbelievable. Al Heyman is unbelievable. And we all, we, we all know, you know, Al Heyman is, he don't, he don't really like his name mentioned. He like to stay behind the scenes, stay behind the scenes. But everything that we came together and did it, is remarkable. When, when I wanted to, the biggest deal in sports history, him and Steven got together and we made it happen. When, you know, with everything, you know, with all the jets, with the three private jets and mansions all around the world, he was a part of everything, helping me uh, uh, reach, get, get and reach everything that I wanted to do in life. So, you know what I mean? And a lot of people keep on saying, they think that Sam Watson is Al Heyman. Al Heyman is the guy that's probably in here tonight, but he's probably sitting there. You know, he liked to, he liked to lay behind the scenes. Hell of a guy, though. And anytime I went to him or I went to Steven, I went to CBS, I went to Showtime, everything that I asked them, they did. Even like with the Hublot deal, you know, uh, you know, I got on, yeah, of course I got on the Hublot right now, because I cut a more time in on the deal with Hublot. You know, I made millions and millions of dollars with Hublot just for, you know, less than 30 minutes. You know, I'm talking about millions of dollars. And then also, you know, like I said before, I learned how to work smarter, not harder. No different from this. You know, I got this hat on up here for a reason. And normally you guys would see me with a money team hat on. So you know they had to pay a hefty price for me to have this hat on. So that's just how it works. What we got? Next question. How you doing, Floyd? Uh, Tony Centeno, Vibe Magazine. Vibe Magazine. Um, before the fight, you released a 42-track playlist, uh, Hard Work and Dedication. Um, now tonight, you know, before and after, what kind of records were playing in your ear, um, aside from the records from that playlist? Uh, on my way, you know, to the venue, what I, what I was playing, everybody always see me on social media with the old school iPod. Because the new, the new school iPod, you're not able to shuffle the songs. But the old school iPod, you can have more diamonds on the old school iPod, and you're able to shuffle the songs. But what I'm listening to is a lot of, I like a lot of old school music. A lot of old school music. Um, come on in, Connor. Listen, I'm listening to a lot of old school music, a lot of old school R&B, a lot of old school rap. What about that Bodak Yellow? Who? Bodak Yellow, Cardi B. Oh, Cardi B. She's, I mean, she's making a mark. You know, she, she's making, she's she done an amazing job to come from, you know, uh, a cast of lovely hip hop to having a. A big song. She, she's truly amazing. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you know, uh, to the podium, I like to call up uh, the notorious one, Conor McGregor.